is forecast to grow at 3.2 and 3.3% in 2024 and 2025 respectively. Headwinds to the global projection remain the tight global financial conditions and ongoing geographical tensions associated with the wars in Gaza and Ukraine, both of which have significant impact on commodity prices and the global supply chain. <coughs> global inflation is forecast to continue to decelerate marginally in 2024, but may stay above the long-run objectives of most advanced economy central banks. Global financial conditions may, therefore, remain broadly tight through 2024 and into 2025. The committee reaffirmed its commitment to continue to monitor developments in the global and domestic economies to guide policy and ensure that inflation expectations are adequately anchored. The next meeting of the committee will be held on the 23rd and 24th of September 2024. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Governor Sam. That was communique number 153, presented by the chairman of the NPC and the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Mr. Ulayemi Kadusu. We will now take questions from the members of the press. Remember to state your name, your medium, and you ask your question. You are entitled to just the question. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, Mr. Governor, members of the MPC. I am Nancy Naji, the anchor for Nancy on uh, Mr. Governor, I think mine is pretty simple, uh, but I will start uh, by asking you to reiterate the rates again. Uh, because it seems we were a bit lost with, we didn't get uh, those rates, so uh, please do that. Uh, the simple question to you really is, um, you are the third percent in Lagos, and um, then you reiterated as a policy maker your commitment uh, to, you know, getting average Nigerians on the streets, uh, solving their problems. Uh, but Mr. Governor, we are also on the streets. And, um, Many Nigerians are really, that average Nigerian you mentioned, are really now severely hurting from the impacts of inflation. So my question to you is, Nigerians also are questioning and are skeptical about the measures that the central bank is taking is not, will it really address the issue and also fix the problem? So Mr. Governor, for those watching now, for those listening, I would like you to uh, you know, perhaps tell Nigerians why this is uh, still uh, on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nancy. Again, let me just reiterate the committee's decisions on the rates. The committee's decisions are as follows. Raise the MPR by 50 basis points to 26.75% from 26.25%. From 26.75% from 26.25%. Adjusted the asymmetric corridor around the NPR from plus 100 to minus 300 to plus 500 to 100 basis points. Retain the cash reserve ratio of deposit money banks at 45% and merchant banks at 14%. And retain the liquidity ratio at 30%. Okay, now to your question, which is a, a, a very valid question. And I think you're probably referring to um, a, an earlier submission. I 
think it was probably at a business day seminar, I believe, where I said, and really I merely reiterated a position I've always held on to, and that is that as policy makers, indeed specifically as financial and economic policy makers, it is very important that we bear in mind the impact of our policies on the man on the street, on the average man on the street. And what gave, why did I say this? Because many times, as um, people in finance, economics, you, they, they, some could be criticized for living in a bubble and being completely disconnected with what happens outside. And from my perspective as a policymaker, that is a failure. Ultimately, if we are doing all the things we are doing and we are not able to impact the mind on the street, ultimately, then what do we really say we've been doing? And I think sometimes when people look at figures too often, they may lose track of that. And that is why I said what I said, that it is so important that we continue to bear that in mind, that our policies must ultimately impact the man on the street. I hear you about the issues you've referred to, Nancy. But I think to adequately address that, it, it, it may be important to um, cast our minds back, okay, and ask ourselves, how did we get to where we are today? Okay, how did we get to where we are today? How did we get to a position where the central bank is using the policies that you say um, are, you are wondering whether they are having their impact? Now, let's not forget that over a period of time, we've had an economy and have failed to diversify that economy. We would argue that uh, the Nigerian economy has basically been a monolithic one in which we've more or less depended on one source of revenue. Now, of course, a monolithic economy has its own risks. And part of those risks, of course, is that if anything happens to your dependency, then the whole system is get shaken. And I guess in many respects, that's part of what we're going through. Part of it, it's not all, it's certainly part of it. Because let's not forget there are, there are global headwinds as well. So it's part of it. And that going forward, we must ensure that we are able to craft policies that are sustainable, okay, and will bring a sustainable method of development for our people. There's no point in policies that are ad hoc and don't really take us to where we want to get to in the long term. Because in, in the business of policy crafting, we must have the long term in view. You don't have the long term in view, you end up paying for it later. So that's where I was coming from. And that um, such policies, of course, must take into consideration um, inclusiveness. Inclusiveness. And that is why at the central bank, um, the issue of financial inclusion has been a, an area of, of great focus. And then, in, of course, it's not just to talk about the policies alone, um, but the implementing process must be, it must be equally robust. And that is where the issue of institutions and strengthening institutions is relevant. Is relevant. No matter the um, policies you craft, if the institutions are not there to support those policies, then you will suboptimize. And again, from the central bank's perspective, that is very, very important. It is very key. Now, these things have to go hand in hand. There's no issue of, you know, doing one and expecting the other to follow. They have to go hand in hand, the crafting of the policies the implementing of the policies. And um, 
Of course, we also have to bear in mind that in the process, given the background I've just mentioned, some of these things, of course, have been with us over a period of time, with the result that um, the economy has suboptimized. Um, so, in the short term, we may find that some of the policies being implemented may appear stringent. But I can assure you that into the medium and to the long term, definitely they will put us on the path of sustainability, which is important, please. It is very important, and that's why I made reference to it. We must focus on sustainable development. Um, we are also finding, and I think this will become more um, um, apparent with time, that our policies are beginning to cascade down and up because there's a period for transition mechanisms to have impact. But we find that gradually they are beginning to turn a, a negative corner. Okay, you know, bit by bit it's moving in, the, in, 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 a, in a relatively uh, more positive trajectory. We will continue to ensure that um, like I said earlier on, the process of implementing policies are those that we are very vigilant on and that um, we ensure that those who play in the, in the area that we supervise play by the rules because that's also very, very, very important. Good afternoon, Mr. Agrofo. My name is Isa Duhav. I write for the Telegraph newspapers. As we rightly noted, inflation is still trending, 34.19% is true. What is the bank assessment of this uh, impact on the households and the country power? And what is being done by the bank to stabilize the economy? Thank you very much, Mr. Um, clearly, two areas that um, pose a challenge. One is in the area of food inflation, which we all know has is, is, is been a bit of a challenge. And the other, of course, is in the area of um, foreign exchange and its own pass-through. Now, with respect to food, um, I would say that, and we said it in the NPC communique, that we notice um, the moves by the um, fiscal side to help taking on certain policies that are helping to moderate um, food inflation and we very much um, are encouraged by that. So we are hopeful. Um, don't forget that a while back we also made a donation of fertilizer which was also you, you given in, with the view to help the situation going forward. Um, on the on the, on the foreign exchange side, because we all accept the fact that uh, the foreign exchange pass-through is very significant. Um, and I'm happy to say that we have seen um, positive outcomes from the tools that we have been using over the recent past. Um, for example, exchange rate has converged, um, limiting the opportunities for arbitrage. This is very important. Um, inflows have increased from 37.93% between January and May in 2024 to um, 38.8% I beg your pardon, to 38.8 billion. Um, and net inflows, more importantly actually, grew by 73.4% uh, May 2024 compared this to May 2023. So that's very good news. And something I speak about all the time on the issue of diaspora remittances. And I'm very pleased to say that um, as at end of June, this had gone up to um, $2.34 billion in comparison to $1.58 billion for the corresponding period last year. Capital importation, again, between January and June, 5.92 billion relative to 1.77 billion dollars for the corresponding period last year. So that's all very positive. 
okay, for foreign exchange um, um, management. Um, we've also seen that on the capital markets, uh, policies uh, having the capital markets responding positively, and of course the banking sector, um, we've you know been very aggressive in giving guidance to the banks with respect to how uh, we want them to position themselves for uh, the future of the one trillion dollar economy. Inflation targeting is something that is an ongoing process, and uh, which will be given more and more guidance as we go along. Good afternoon, Mr. Abdo. I am James Ebejo with this day. Um, the real sector players are really, you know, having the heat over the continuous hike in the interest rate. They have been complaining. I want to ask, sir, are you having any uh, engagement with them in order to, you know, uh, make them see why this uh, is so? Because um, the way it is now, some of them are even saying that their jobs are threatened and all, all that. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, James. Yeah, the, 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 the straight answer to your question is yes, we are engaging with them. Um, we've had a number of different fora with them, both in some cases individually um, and in many cases collectively. And it's something that we will continue to do so, so to at least explain the reasons why we are taking some of the measures we are taking. However, I think I'll just say one or two things. One is to understand, and these are some of the things that we discuss with the, with the organized private sector, that inflation really and truly is having a major impact on our economy. Purchasing power is getting eroded, people are being pushed into different categories of poverty, and it is in their own interest that we are able to tame the scourge of inflation. If not, the ramifications will also be for them. It's not, it's not uh, on, on, the, on the average money, it will also be for them. And we understand the need for growth, and we also understand that it is, it, it is relatively challenging when you have high interest rates. We also understand that. And quite frankly, my belief is that it is so fundamental to the long-term future and stability of our economy that inflation should be brought under control, that in the short term, these are pains which ultimately will be able to help our economy and help the manufacturing um, businesses as well. However, it's also important to reflect on how we got to where we are, okay? And let's not forget that this was largely as a result of a tremendous amount of, uh, of liquidity that came into the system in a relatively short space of time, okay? When you print money on ways and means, it has its consequences, and we are paying for those consequences right now, unfortunately. Unfortunately, we all witnessed a situation where money supply trajectory got out of hand and it is, you know, the response to this that interest rates have gotten to where they are in a bid to manage that money supply better and to ensure that things do not spike out of control. The governor members of the NPC, my name is Sonny Michael. Thank you, Sunday. Let me, let me just correct you because this is um, a, it's a common, um, what you just said is a, a pretty common view, but it is much more than four months. You recall that in November of last year at the, at the Chartered Institute of Bankers Forum, I actually did say that we were going to get the banks to recapitalize. I did say that at the time. And, um, that was a very clear signal to the banking industry as to where we are going to go to. Since that time, of course, I think it was March, April, where, you know, the 
the um, specific numbers were given up, but we are given more than enough time for the banks to begin the process of putting that in order. And I must also stress to you um, someday that unlike many policies that um, stakeholders may be used to in Nigeria, in this particular case, we've given adequate time, two years. So we're telling the banks, don't be in a rush, take your time and ensure that over a two-year period, you comply with this directive. Okay, so it is considering the importance of this thing and ensuring that we do not push the banks into any kind of stress other than to eventually get to where they should be getting to, especially considering the foreign exchange devaluations and other things, and also giving them enough buffers to absorb shocks. Now, in terms of where do we stand, well, so far so good. Um, those who are going out to the market to raise money have begun the process of doing so and also those who are reporting back to us as to how they are going to do their, their, their private raises are also doing the same. So, so far so good. Good afternoon, Mr. Gomez, members of the NPC community. My name is Sarah Chibobo, Channels TV. Just to find out what informed your um, recent policy on um, dormant um, accounts, there's been a mixed reaction in the public space. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Okay, now I think, but I can't be sure that perhaps some of the mixed reaction could have come from the um, lack of or misunderstanding between dormant and domiciliary. Okay, this particular directive is with respect to dormant accounts, not domiciliary accounts, dormant accounts. Now, I don't know about you, but um, over the years, in my experience, uh, what I found personally is that um, if you leave accounts dormant in banks, sometimes more than when you don't leave them dormant in banks, in fact, most times, they are more susceptible to fraudsters copying your identity and trying to gain the system to grab hold of your money. Okay, so that is a problem that I think most money banks face. And I'm sure if you've been on the receiving end, I have been, then you know that anything that can protect you in the process from these kinds of predators will be welcome. The policy and the directive is meant to ensure that all those monies come to the central bank for safekeeping. You don't lose your money. You don't lose your money. And it's at zero cost to the beneficiaries. All that will happen is that the central bank will manage the monies within our possession. And when the rightful owner surfaces, the money is returned plus whatever income is accrued to, to, to you. And I think this should be a welcome development, even from the naysayers, because at a time like this, we recognize the fact that everybody needs every single penny that belongs to them to accrue to them, and not have a situation where you are, you are, you are putting money in a particular uh, place and um, essentially end up losing it. Of course, it will create liquidity within the system as well. Thank you so much, Mr. Governor. I have a question from Zaka Hali, Leadership Newspapers, and I'm, I'd like to ask your question on his behalf. He said, Mr. Governor, the common man is suffering. From your vantage point, as Governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, what is your perspective on the outlook of the Nigerian economy? Thank you, Thank you very much um, to Zaka. Thank you for that question, which is a very valid question and one that 
we should all be concerned about. Where is this all going to? Especially in an environment where we see that inflation, as we've witnessed today, is, you know, is still there with us. However, much as inflation is a challenge, we are also seeing some cooling down in inflation. We are seeing some cooling down in inflation. And we expect that as time goes along, um, that will continue. That will continue and result in, in, in a positive trajectory eventually. Again, foreign exchange continues to be a challenge, but I think I've mentioned that we are seeing positive results from the very, very hard work that the central bank has embarked upon over the recent months. Some very, very positive outcomes. I've spoken about the fact that our reserves are being boosted and that relative to last year, we're seeing greater velocity and more inflows coming in, which essentially, in my view, is a question of building back trust and restoring credibility. Because I want to say something here, um, Zaka. No matter what we do in terms of policies, if we don't have trust and we don't bring back credibility, all those policies will come to very little. So I'm very pleased that at least in terms of the trust deficit that we have had, we are slowly but surely beginning to rise out of it. How do I know this? Apart from the numbers that I have reeled out today, it is also a reflection of what the, those who make it their business to follow the developments of banks, central banks, world economies are all coming out to say yes, central bank is on the right trajectory and the Nigerian economy is on the right trajectory. I would be concerned if that wasn't the case. I would be very, very, very concerned if we found ourselves going on the opposite direction in terms of the different macroeconomic policies. Some of the other things, um, debts to GDP, tax to GDP, those are all things that are being fixed from the fiscal side and we see the efforts that are being made which both the fiscal and the monetary collaborate. I'm convinced that barring any unforeseen um, circumstances, and I must say, in saying this, I must also say that CBN extra vigilant we will not go to sleep on our responsibilities. We will not. <clears throat> but to emphasize that the collaboration between the fiscal and the monetary side, continuing in the way and strengthening the, 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 the handshake um, across both sides, is, I'm confident, will take us to a much, much better place where the building blocks will be there and the growth which the organized private sector rightly talk, talk about, they'll find they will have a solid foundation on which to grow the economy of this country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Governor Sam. Members of the press, this brings to conclusion the press conference for today. Thank you much, very much for coming and see you in September. Thank you very much. Verdict from the Apex Bank Governor there. Uh, the NPR now stands at 26.75%. Uh, that is what we have at the moment. CRR remains at 45%. We'll stay on all of this and continue to bring you up to speed with uh, 
discussions around the resolution after this very important meeting and all of the considerations. But let's move to another very important topic today. Mr. Aliko Dangote, Africa's richest man, has recently stirred significant discussions among experts by offering to sell his multi-billion dollar refinery to the NNPC Limited. Meanwhile, NNPC's equity stake in the refinery has also come. A lot of complaints back and forth, about 20% to just 7.2%. That's what Mr. Dangote said. A lot of developments are around this, but what are the real issues? I'm being joined by a lawyer and an energy consultant. It's by Stanley Bros Oshoma. Good to see you. Happy birthday. And uh, you heard the CBN governor, but if we'll yes. stay with that, we won't talk about this <laughs> yes, today. But a happy birthday to you. Let yeah, me get a hand. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Let's start this conversation with this back and forth that we've seen in recent times between the NMDPRA and NPC and all of that. What is your general understanding of these issues? Yeah. Um, when you operate in um, a capitalist environment, it is um, survival of the fittest. Mm. Um, so that's basically what is playing out here. So in this industry, the, the margins are very small, very small margin. And then you have, um, you know, commodity traders that are, you know, doing trillions you know, of, of, um, of dollars, not naira, not trillions of dollars, you know, compared to a Dangote. And so, uh, being um, operating in a free market, certainly those commodity traders also will look out for their own. At the same time, Dangote would also want to look out for its own. So, what usually happens in uh, such an environment, and so what I'm thinking is, um, yeah, because all of this boils down to energy security. The federal government, in trying to protect its own investor, will at the same time also not want to put their energy security in the hands of one person. Because when you do that, you, you would mortgage the country you know, in the hand of one person. So basically what's playing out is you know, what you would ordinarily call boardroom policies you know, thrown in the public. Hmm. Now, um, talking about the shares of 7.2%, 20%, there's also the back and forth regarding that. But my issue is energy security here. Uh, if the NNPC is not investing anymore in that facility, trying to invest in clean energy, uh, how does this affect the whole uh, ultimate trust of achieving energy security? Yeah, um, energy security, we're talking about energy security, really. Uh, it's not about just one business. We're having all of these challenges because our refineries are not, not up and grinding. Yeah. If our refineries were up and grinding, then you wouldn't have this back and forth of an MPC uh, or uh, the um, mid and um, downstream claiming that Dangote wants all you know, um, diesel importer to come through him. If you had your refineries, you have um, the 60,000 barrel refinery in Port Harcourt and the 120,000 barrel refinery working and then the Kaduna refinery working, and all your pipelines are up to date, yes. and they are not corroded, and then your nitrogen plants are up and running, then you won't have these challenges because um, you won't, there won't be any need for somebody to import diesel in the first place. And all of the issues of oh, whether the sulfur content of that diesel yeah, yeah. is high or not <laughs> will not be there. So what we need to do first and foremost is not even to, to, to buy Dangote refinery. It is to look in what? Look into our refineries and put them up to date. Last time I did complain, I, I also um, did question the workability of our 60,000 barrel refinery that NMPC said was going to work in December. And from my understanding, what I gathered was that what they just simply did was to flood our refinery with ROPG. And um, the mechanical components were still not up to date. So the issue of um, now buying Dangote refinery shouldn't even come in. And then the issue of the stake in Dangote refinery. Mind you, all of this, you have a lot of um, sentiment playing out here. A lot of people, oh, Dangote is a businessman. This was the same thing they did to Alain Oyema. It's business, really. So we should look at it from the business angle and take out the sentiment. The federal government, when the same federal government decided to invest 20% stake, yes in the Dangote refinery. The same people that are complaining today were the same people that cried. The MFL is giving dollar that is not available to Dangote. He's doing round tripping and the rest. And so I think um, that transaction, the federal government paid in $1 billion, and um, the balance $1.7 billion was tied to a 300 barrel per day you know, forward sale agreement. Yeah. And so now, also, if you look at that apart from that forward sale agreement, you have a 90,000 barrel 
per day for what sale agreement also that the federal government entered into mm -hmm. with Afrizin Bank for the $3.3 billion that they collected as loan. Mm -hmm. You also have um, another 30... 5,000 barrels per day for $1 billion from Lucky Funding Limited. Mm. You have 8,000 barrels per day, crude arrangement. Commitments. These are commitments, yes, from um, for the um, Chevron gas um, plant buyback. So all of these are commitments that are already on ground. So if an MPC now says, look, from even the, uh, what do you call it, sharing agreement, profit sharing agreement that they have with the IOCs, 60-40 in most cases, that what is available will not be enough to fulfill that arrangement, initial arrangement. And so they are going to look at you know, other alternatives. Yes, they have a right to, to so do. But at the same time, in doing that, you also have a right to, no matter how little, find a way to protect your local investor, which is um, Dangote. That's why it will ought to have been a win-win situation for them. But this rough or rough or fight of all the it is 45% uh, completed, and it shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. I also do not agree that the refinery is 45% completed. It is more than that, because a refinery that is 45% completed will not be producing AGU. AGU, uh, you know, that. because... For, General, that's, or yeah, yes, because for the refinery, there are, you have the mechanical completion process where all of um, the equipment, you know, would have been tested, your crude distillation unit will be t tested. Your uh, uh, FCC will be tested. And then you have the testing and commissioning. The testing and commissioning process ordinarily does not mean that you cannot produce crude. Okay. You produce crude, but it probably will not you know, meet the standard by the local authority. That is why you know, the standard of the crude is you know, in question here. But I would say that the process, the commissioning process is far more than than 45, but maybe not up to 100. And another thing that can happen on all of this is for Dangote to open up their books mm. and the refinery to the regulators to look. The idea of um, trying to keep some and hide some and then the, what do you call it, um, the House of Rep Committee that visited ref uh, the Dangote refinery, who yeah. amongst them, who amongst those committee members is really you know, an energy expert. We, are, we have uh, vulnerable members here that really don't, you know, hire experts to advise them on issues. So as you're going into those places also, the regulators should be part of that team to be able to look at, you know, what, um, the, what the issues are. And I like the fact that they are meeting anyway now so that all of the issues will be addressed and um, all of these things will be put behind us so that we won't have all this back and forth. Some people are trying to... Uh, ensure that I do not survive as a businessman. Others are saying, no, you have a um, refinery here in Malta. Uh, that's why you don't yes. want the Dangote refinery. Work. Look, let me tell you, Tolu, the, even if you have a refinery in Malta, you have a refinery in um, America, you have a refinery in Poland, that does not affect in any way the workability of a Dangote refinery here. Anyway, that's an ambitious <laughs> refinery. Mind you, you have a Boa refinery of 200,000 uh, uh, capacity also coming in up. Nigeria coming up. So if all of the, the more the merrier, really. But the problem we have is that we are not producing enough crude. Mm. We are not producing. And then coupled with the pipeline vandalization, do you know that the Dangote refinery even are using a VLCC? to ferry crude to the refinery. There are no pipelines to those places. And another challenge that they have is the crisis in the Niger Delta. The refinery is in a place where you do not have raw materials. The, the oil, the crude that you need to, to, to refine, it's in Niger Delta, so you need to use VLCC to take them to these places. So all these are challenges. The issue of why I think, uh, let, me let me just jump in now, also comes in. Many believe that if you allow uh, a particular refinery to be the sole importer uh, of goods, uh, goods, you know, or distributor of this particular goods, maybe the IOCs are worried that maybe, what do you think about, uh, about that? Too? No, see, no, no country in the world will put its energy security in the hands of one man. Let's not deceive ourselves. And I do not also, I will not think that's what Dangote is asking for. Mm. Because if he's asking for that, then it is wrong. Do you know that civilized countries can go to war if you threaten the energy security? Mm. And so when you put energy security in the hands of one man, let me tell you what, let me, let me tell you the Nigerian scenario, what will play out. 
you have the middlemen. The middlemen are not dealers. They are not stakeholders. They are not independent marketers. So the middlemen are the ones that will be getting allocation. And then what they just need to do is to add one naira to that allocation and then sell to the dealers. And then there will be crisis. So the day the, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, the refinery says we do not have, and then you are now running back to your commodity traders that you have abandoned. So it becomes a crisis for you. So what you do is to ensure that every, because it's a willing seller, willing buyer, Thing. So, also, if you give your 445,000 barrel for local consumption yeah. to, to one man, for example, and the refinery is in, um, uh, in a free trade zone, is buying from you, you cannot, no matter the agreement, you cannot tie him down to say whatever you refine here must be sold to the local market. So, that's why what should happen is there should be a middle ground. Mm. We give, we already, the, the, the crude is already tied to a lot of, you know, apart from the sharing formulas, you also already have a lot of wholesale agreement tied to it. So the government should find a way, like the president has suggested, to squeeze out a little for Dangote uh, to ensure that, you know, it encourages the investment here, and which is what they are currently doing anyway. You know, but so that we, we discount this idea of fight here, fight here, because we also, the country also need to protect its investors. Yeah. So there will be any need for, for fight, but putting your energy security in the hands of one man, I will not encourage it. No country will encourage it. Nobody, even though every businessman in Nigeria want to be a monopoly, mm. we every businessman here want to monopolize their space. You know, some people will say, you, you know, they refer to the fight between Dangote and Boa on cement and then refer to Ibetu and all of yeah. those things. These are issues that ordinarily shouldn't come up. But what we also need to do, really, uh, yes, uh, OPEC, OPEC, OPEC quota. Mm. OPEC quota, we are not even meeting it. Yeah, we are not. Our OPEC quota was 2.5 million barrel per day. Because we weren't even meeting it, it was reduced to 1.8 million. And yeah. as we speak, we are around 1.2, not even up yeah. to 1.3. One, yeah. So if you have, if you are able to protect your pipelines, do you know that in the 60s we built pipelines and we built, what do you call it, um, depot across the country? You have 20 depot, NMPC depot across the Federation. That once you pump crude in, in Worry, for example, or in Escravos, in a few matter of uh, minutes or hours, you have it everywhere. But today, you have a situation where you have to you know, ferry crude from you know, Escravos to Dangote. If you imagine the man hour and the additional cost. Of that is why the cost of producing crude in Saudi Arabia, in Aram Saudi Aramco, it's way lesser. You have about $10 per barrel. But here, you are hovering around 30, 35 to 50, 50 barrel, barrel. Uh, for $50 per barrel, per barrel yeah. because right. of this additional cost. So right. if we are able to increase our, our output, all of this borrowing and all of this forward sale agreement in the first place won't be there. Because if you have 2.5 million, let's even say 1.8 million barrel, already the 1.2 that you have is tied to forward sale agreement and, you know, all these importations that you're talking about. Then you have some for not even the 650,000 barrel. Because if you give 650,000 barrel to Dangote, I also can tell you that because they are at the, at the testing stage, their FCC will not be up and doing at this time. And so you won't be able to distill PMS from that refinery. Mm. So if you give 650,000 barrel, 650,000 barrel, which you don't even have. Yeah. yeah which you don't even have. That's about over half. Yes, that leaves you with nothing to... Mind you, it is the sale of this crew that you make for us from. We're talking about CBN now and all of that. So, and, and that's why if you increase your output, certainly there'll be enough to go around. Mm. And then this idea of, oh, I must be the sole importer, that will that also be able to make money. And then people gradually will leave importation and come to Dangote. That's the way business runs. Naturally. And not naturally, and not for, one, for everybody to say, oh, no, you must come to me. Also, and let me quickly point out, yes, because some minute. persons yes, had sir. said that um, the PI, PIA, there's a provision in the PIA that um, the local refineries must be, must crude, must, must be, crude. you know, uh, given to the local refinery before, you know, export. Yeah, but you find out that, that the question there, this PIA, we are still talking about it and we will still continue to talk about it because, you know, some people had to smuggle in some of these sections for their, for their benefit. But the question is, 
is there enough to give to everybody? It is not enough. So what the federal government should do, like I said, is increase output. Once you increase output, there will be enough for everybody. We must have a part of this conversation. I must thank you. At so your service. Much. <laughs> I must thank you so much for speaking to Mr. Lipros or Shoma there. He's a lawyer and an energy consultant. Thank you so much. Uh, I wish you a uh, very happy year as you move on. My pleasure. All right. Pleasure. Well, that's our show today. Thank you so much. Tomorrow we'll stay fully with the resolutions from the NPC meeting. Break it down and see what all of this means for the real sector and the entire economy. I'll see you. Stay safe. Get busy. Make some cash. The Inspector General of Police has met with senior officers to review the state of security.